25th anniversary. The Aliagana Singers made up of Monstrations, uh, all folks with Monstra Connections, based in the United Kingdom. Every 5th anniversary, they put out an anniversary song. And uh, observing 25th anniversary. Officially, we recorded activities of the Montreal to Free Hills Volcano, 1995 to 2020. And the Alligana Singers, for the 20th, they put out one song. And uh, for the 25th, the latest, which is called Thank You. So you tell them you heard their music voices right here on ZJB Radio. Stay with us because coming up in a little bit, the MVO Talks, Montserrat Volcano Observatory, they're going to be on. All right, so we invite you to stay tuned to us right here on ZJB Radio. ZJB Radio, Munzerat. Listen to us live on www.zjb.gov.ms. Good morning. Good morning, Montserrat, and to all of our visitors around the world. Welcome to MVO Talks. My name is Vita Wade, and I'm the acting education outreach coordinator at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. So today at MVO Talks, as I said last time we were here, is that we're changing it up and we have a panel discussion uh, today with some very interesting guests from um, locally on our team from as well as across the world. And the topic for today's session is monitoring the Sofria Hills Volcano, an overview of the ongoing um, monitoring the evolution, the methods, and the challenges faced. 
So in terms of housekeeping, as we usually go through, if you are experiencing any issues with regards to um, you know, your connection on Facebook or YouTube, because as you, as you know, we are live streaming on the GRU Montserrat YouTube page. If you're experiencing any difficulties, just log off quickly and come back on. Radio listeners, you are welcome to participate by calling in to Radio ZJB on 491-7227, or you can WhatsApp us on 495-2029, and we're looking forward to your participation. So, our guests today include uh, Mr. Roderick Stewart, who is volcano seismologist at the MVO and former MVO director. Roderick will actually start our discussion today with a 15-minute presentation. We also have in the house uh, Mr. Mr. Carlisle Pico Williams, and um, we are very pleased to have Pico with us. He is the instrumentational uh, engineer at the MVO. We also have on the line, um, direct from the United States Geological Survey, renowned volcanologist, Dr. Andy Lockhart. So it's promising to be an engaging session and we're asking everybody who's listening at home and abroad to please join in. Let's talk, let's, let's discuss the, the journey of uh, Sofria Hills of the past 25 years. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the session over to Mr. Roderick Stewart. It's our pleasure to have you introduce the opening presentation. Okay, thank you, Vita. So I'm just going to quickly give an overview of monitoring of the volcano. And I have this short presentation here. So we start off, what is monitoring? It's very simple. We measure or we observe something. We process the data that's from that, and then we store that. Is the presentation being shared? Should be. Oh. Okay. Please hang on a second. I, I'm, I'm slightly confused because I'm not sure if I've got my presentation being shared or not. Yes, it is. Okay. So that's what monitoring is in a nutshell, just measuring something, processing it somehow, and then storing it. And this, this applies to everything applies to sort of complex data from cameras and, and ground deformation and things. But it also implies to photographs and things that we see. It's very important to measure, to process and to store and to keep the dates with it, to keep the time with it. I had a question only two days ago from someone saying what happened in July 1995 and they were wanting the exact time of something. And if we hadn't done proper monitoring and stored the times, we'd be a little bit stuck. Now, MVO uses a lot of monitoring methods, and I've got a list of them on screen. I, I really don't think I should bother reading them all out. Um, but we would use a lot of different things for monitoring the volcano. But we really have five core monitoring methods, the ones that we sort of base our, 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 our analysis on, our assessments on. And these are seismic monitoring, which is looking for small earthquakes under the volcano, Ground deformation, looking for movement of the ground using either GPS or electronic distance measurement. The gas emissions from the volcano, looking mainly at the sulphur dioxide, but we look at other gases as well. Then we have visual observations, including from thermal cameras, and then the sampling and analysis of deposits. So those five are sort of core monitoring methods. But the, the big challenge with, with this eruption is it's been going for 25 years and technology has changed and the science has changed in that time. And one of the big challenges is sort of keeping a constant level of monitoring and being able to compare data from today with the data from 25 years ago. This is a map showing the monitoring stations that we have on Montserrat. I haven't counted them recently, but I think there's more than 50 in total. Michael's nodding to me. The stations are all fairly similar. They consist of equipment in boxes, um, people staring, often people staring at it, wondering why it's not working. So this is a seismic station with a seismometer to measure ground vibration, a GPS receiver site, lots of boxes, lots of things, a spectrometer for, for measuring gas. What these stations have all got in common is that they're usually in a remote location Less than 50% of our stations can be reached by road. And for the core monitoring 
technologies. I think it's even higher. It's even higher than that. We're probably less than a third of the stations are reachable by road. There's no power, so we have to have power there with solar panels, and we have to send the data back with a radio link. And this is a real challenge: just keeping these things running. Everyone is aware that MVO has frequent use of a helicopter, although that's changed a little bit recently. People think that we use the helicopter to make observations. Like, the largest use of the helicopter is actually taking labourers out into the field and cutting down the vegetation around these stations because things grow, they grow over the solar panels and if we don't regularly maintain the stations we, we will actually lose them and unfortunately because of some recent not having the helicopter regularly it, it's got quite difficult to get into these stations. So the challenge is to really keep these stations running and doing sort of routine maintenance on them. Again, here's just a camera site showing solar panel and the, the, the antenna. So the challenges, station access and power, which I just talked about. Getting to the stations, maintaining them, because they're, they're having to work in a very tough environment. Telemetry, getting the data back from the stations is, is a big challenge. And then continuity, the word I put here is basically being able to compare data from today with data from 25 years ago. Actually combining our, our, our data sets together. The data telemetry is, is a big challenge. The, and the main problem for that is that the volcano is volcano shaped. We have to use radios to send back data. And these radios require you to be line of sight. The receiver has to see the transmitter. And if you just had MVO in the volcano, you look at the volcano, you'd only see 50% of it. You can't see things around the back. So we have to have long radio paths. And this is just a, a map showing our seismic stations and the radio paths that they use. And stations on the east of the island are fired all the way up to Silver Hills, to a repeater. Silver Hills can't see MVO, so they then go down to Alveston, and then from Alveston up to MVO. So they go through two repeaters. Stations on the south of the island go to Garibaldi Hill and then to MVO. So maintaining a sort of complex radio network is, is, is very, very important. And this, in some ways, is getting more difficult. Back in the early days of the eruption, we didn't have the mobile phone network that we have now. We didn't have the demand on, on bandwidth. So you could just come in with your radios, set them up and work. But now we're having problems getting competing with the bandwidth. I mean, some of our stations use the same frequencies that Wi-Fi does. And we have to be much more aware of the, the telemetry aspects of it. Data continuity is another big thing. This is our favourite graph. It's a graph that shows 25 years of data for the entire eruption from 1995 up until now. And it shows plots for three different types of data. The number of earthquakes per day, the ground movement with our GPS network, and the SO2 emissions. But the networks change through, through time. If you look at the, the centre plot, which is the ground deformation, we have a red line and we have a blue line. That's because the red line stopped working in 2018 because we had to take that station out. We have no station in there that has worked throughout the entire eruption. So it's very, very important to try and make sure that data it can be compared backwards. And this often means when you put in a new bit of equipment, you need it to overlap with the old bit of equipment so you can compare them. It, it's very, very difficult to rip something out and then put something else in. It, 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 but sometimes you're, you're forced to do that sort of thing. So data continuity is, is incredibly important. There's also some very unusual biases. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is in seismology. This is a plot showing the number of earthquakes per month, no, earthquakes per day back in 2009, 2010. The top two plots show what look like maybe cycles of earthquakes. But the third plot down shows the number of stations that are actually operating, which is normally up around eight. But there was a period around here when we lost a lot of stations. And this was actually due to ash on the solar panels losing power. And so the number of stations dropped for a significant period of time. And this coincides with a drop in the actual number of earthquakes that we've detected. And I'm fairly certain now that this drop here isn't real, 
because it's due to the, the, the lack of stations, whereas the earlier drop is real. So we really have to understand a lot of the nuances of our monitoring to use the data. Every week we come on the radio and we say there's been seven earthquakes. But that number depends on how many seismometers you've got, the, the, the noise threshold and, and other things. In truth, there's actually more than seven, but there's seven that meet our criteria for reporting. And trying to keep that constant is very, very difficult. And it's even more difficult if you go back into history, back to the seismic activity in the 70s and the 30s when we didn't have instruments. Then when they talk about earthquakes, they were earthquakes that were felt. If we only had felt earthquakes during this eruption, we would have a much, much smaller data set. So we lose stations, and we lose stations, as we said, to ash on them. We also lose stations. This is, there's a bushfire in, where was it? It was um, Amersham, that region. Broderick. Broderick's Amersham last week, and this is one of our stations. We lost quite a few. Some of it just evaporated, just melted by, by the heat. Um, here's another amazing example of damage. This is one of our seismic stations. Five solar panels, a pit with a seismometer, and then there's a big trench just off them. That's a volcanic bomb that was thrown out from the volcano and narrowly missed smashing up our station. So maintaining them is, is, is a challenge just in terms of the environment and the, the sort of wear and tear on our stations. And then the final thing to say is computing. We'd be nothing if we didn't keep and check this data that we've got coming in. So MVO has a, a large investment in computing, data storage, backups, things like this. And this is another thing that's changed with time. Some of our data from 1990s is stored on zip drives. I don't know if anyone remembers zip drives. And I think we had to go into eBay to get a drive reader to read the data from them sort of thing. So we keep very much up with, with, with the computing side of things. This is just a photograph of three of our work experience students who, I'm not sure what they were doing that day. These are like, like old computers that were getting thrown out, but uh, computing is very, very important. So that's it for the overview that I was asked to give, and I think we should open it up to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stewart. That was, that was very informative. I love the, the photographs that you're using as well in your discussion. Um, takes us to place and time. So we are open for the talk session. Let's talk about the, the monitoring of the MVOs um, you know, scientific, from a scientific perspective, the technical perspective, but also um, looking at the evolution of the equipment, um, of the monitoring, as well as those methods used. I wanted to share with you that we are live on Radio ZJB, so you can you can call in, and we'll we'll be able to take your call live on four nine one seven two two seven. Don't be shy. Um, please do, um, you know, get your questions out there as well. And we look forward to even hearing from some of the young people in our community. If you have any questions on Facebook Live, we'll try to put them in. So to start the session off, um, I wanted to, to find out from you you all and, and bring in Dr. Um, Andy Lockhart into the conversation straight away. What was your first experience, Dr. Lockhart, with um, the Safria Hills volcano? <laughs> well, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Excellent. So. My first experience was in 95, uh, just after the first, uh, uh, the first uh, ga gas, the first ash emission, the first explosion in July of 95, I uh, arrived on Montserrat with, uh, with uh, the rest of my crew from uh, the US Geological Survey from the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program. And we'd been uh, invited by the, by the Montserratian government to come and help uh, the SRU, who was there at the time, um, Leo Mambe and Lloyd Lynch uh, among them, they had a seismic network going. They had a data acquisition and analysis system going. They had occupied a space in, in one of the uh, government offices in downtown Plymouth. And we had invited to come and help out with some tools and techniques that we had that uh, would help augment their 
uh, their monitoring system. And there were basically two things that we brought. One was a, another data acquisition and analysis system that we ran in parallel to theirs to gather seismic data. The Soufriere, Hill, the Soufriere system that they had um, established already was optimized for tectonic earthquake location. The system that we brought, which we called the Willie Lee system for its, uh, for its inventor here, was a tectonic system that had been, tectonic monitoring system that had been modified for volcano monitoring capabilities, especially using tools like RSAM, which is the uh, acronym for the Real-Time Seismic Amplitude Monitor that basically looks at continuous seismic data to look for changes in seismic energy output, which is really useful at a volcano. We also brought uh, some uh, telemeter tilt meters, which we scattered around the, uh, around the volcano. Um, and I was part of that team. I was there July through August and maybe into September of that year, I stayed um, uh, long enough to see the uh, see the network through a, through a tropical storm that came through, um, and then I left just before the first dome appeared in the uh, in in the crater, and unfortunately, I have I have never been back. So my experience <laughs> on Montserrat is, is is limited to that to that uh, few months in in 1995 at the at the beginning. But I have been working on other volcanoes in other parts of the world since then and, and can speak to how uh, sort of volcano monitoring has, has evolved over the last uh, quarter century. Thank you so much, Dr. Lockhart. It, and um, it's certainly interesting to, to hear. Go ahead, Rod. Go I just ahead. want to interject here because I think Andy's underplaying himself a little bit here. Um, he came here as part of what was called, was it, the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, which is basically the U.S. has a, a monitoring system set up that they can quickly deploy to anywhere in the world. And I've seen this in action in other places. And it means with, within a couple of weeks, they can have a fully operational system up and working. And this is really important for places that have no monitoring at all. We had the University of the West Indies monitoring happening at the time, but it's just incredible the way that it was set up to do that, and, and the VDAP program's been very useful in, in very, you know, various places. So yeah. I think that just the way you talk about it, it just all oh, became and we set some stuff, stuff up. It was very much planned in advance. They, they had a, a way of helping out. Yeah, it, it, it did seem. I was, I was able to visualize this team of scientists running onto the island and with, with an incredible amount of gear. It just oh. sounded like you had tons and tons of gear. And how did you get it in? Did you fly in? Did it come in a helicopter? You know, it must have been stuck some, on a boat. I don't know. How did that it, gear it, get I, here? I can't remember how it worked here, but in other places, it, it's often covered by a, the American aid program and stuff. So. When I was in Papua New Guinea, it, it came in a, a, a United States Her Hercules, which had actually come all the way from Alaska, which is an amazing distance to have brought the equipment. So, and, and, and the logistics of getting everything from A to B is something that they had worked out in advance, so it just helped their rapid deployment. Incredible, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lockhart, for your contribution so far. So, um, so yeah. Doctor, uh, Mr. Stewart, what was your experience like? You know, when did you arrive first um, on Montserrat? So I, I arrived sometime in '96, and um, Andy unfortunately had left by then, but there were still yes. the Americans were around. We had two seismic networks. We had lots of scientists. We had quite a bit of bickering at the time. Everywhere I've worked in the world, scientists argue. It's, just, it's, just, it it's a stressful situation. <laughs> yeah, though. but they all think they know more than everyone else, yeah, and I'm I'm like that as well. <laughs> so, but and, and there's a lot of things being done on the fly. This is what I found really impressive: is is people trying to sort of come up with monitoring techniques, things that could help you. And, and an example is that um, there were some cracks on Chances Peak. I remember, and therefore people would go up there regularly in a helicopter and measure those cracks once a day or once every two days, go up and they'd measure this. And, and you have to work out a way of this being repeatable, you know, so they'd put in some very solid pins 
and then they'd measure the same distance. But then, of course, they'd get destroyed and they'd have to do other things. But there was an awful lot of ad hoc, how can we do this? How can we do this? How can we use photographs? Because we had a, a lot of, of, of very bright people here arguing a little bit, but re working together most, most of the time, trying to put their minds to the problems of, of what's going on. And the seismic and the tilt and, and the other sort of things are, are standard, but there's a lot of other stuff that, that, that people want to work on. And it, it's quite amazing, a lot of the ad hoc things that were going on. Yeah, it's incredible to imagine what's happening behind the scenes. And, and the other thing, of course, is the, the, the danger aspect. Um, people, scientists, are very keen to you know, climb up volcanoes and stick their toe into the how hot it is sort of thing. But you have to make, when you've got so many people working, you actually have to make sure things are done safely. In fact, that was my first job when I came. Mm. I was sort of liaison between different scientific groups to try and make sure things went safely. I don't think, I'm not sure if you did. Yeah, and I think it's important to... <laughs> So people recognise too that at that time there was no Montserrat Volcano Observatory. It was actually operating through the, the seismic research unit in Trinidad. Well, no, no, the, the, na it? the name MVO came up quite quickly. It was within a couple of months. So okay. there was always something called the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. It's just, it, it, it was run in different ways. So initially okay. it was the SRC in Trinidad or the SRU. Then when USGS were here and, and British scientists and other people, they had like a rotating director system. Then we moved to the BGS, the British Geological Survey, running it. And then, God, how many years ago is it now? It went back to the University of the West Indies, the seismic research unit. So, okay. But it's a large problem managing these scientists, managing things. And, and, and another thing is just the scientific discussions. We'd, every night we would have scientific discussions and they were quite um, testy at times because of people. <laughs> to, say the least. to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so over to you, Mr. Williams, and I've been I've been asked to you know refer to you as Pico, <laughs> which is what we all lovingly uh, refer to you yes, as on yes. team at um, on Montserrat in general and also at the MVO. So tell me about your first experiences of the volcano. You know, when did you arrive on the scene? Okay. What was it like in the field? All right. Um, so initially, I worked at the. Uh, volcano monitoring unit in St. Vincent and as Montserrat was it's all a part of the what was SRC uh, SRU back then and initially I was sent to Montserrat by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as part of the SRC team um, back then the regional um, governments were trying to assist Montserrat in whichever way they can and that assistance came um, in 1998, I arrived on island. I was initially scheduled to come in 96. Um, there were two of us, three of us at the unit in St. Vincent, and um, I had to give way to one of my um, co-worker. And then so we kept in touch trying to do different things. Richie Robinson, who is um, who was head of the unit in Trinidad at the time and play, uh, was here very frequently, he was also my boss in St. Vincent but was on loan to the SRC. I think he probably still is on loan. Um, so there was that connection going, so we were all sort of a big team and all hoping to get out here. And um, if you, well, whatever it is you're doing, you'd always want to get to the, you know, the action spot. And since we're all in Vulcan and monitoring, Montserrat was sort of the apex of everything at the time. And, you know, we're all itching to get a chance to come to Montserrat. Um, my chance came in 98. Um, and so I came in 1998 um, initially for one month. I stayed for two months and two weeks, stayed an additional six weeks um, working, and um, then came back again in, in May of that year and um, haven't left since. I was on a short BGS contract and then um, haven't left. But each time I came, basically, I, I stayed extra and you know put in the work because there was a lot of work to be done, especially on the, the hands-on work. So there was a lot of um, scientific staff around doing work um, the the technical bit itself um, needed a bit of support, and that's where I came in to try to you know boost the, the scientific work. There was uh, Dave Williams, um, on the ground, Lloyd Lynch, uh, Chan, and a few other persons, Bal, and so on from Trinidad. Um, but the you know small team, always a small team on the ground getting the, the work done. Um, so my first um, not so nice experience 
just probably within a few days of coming here, um, we went out to to um, Hermitage to do some insulation. It was on a Saturday, and um, we were there doing the insulation, and there was a call on the radio. Some activities started taking place, and we got this call. And um, Willie Aspinall, who was with us, just monitoring the radio, because as Rod mentioned, the safety aspect is you know very important. But when you work and you really don't pay any mind to it, and um, there's several different layers of things that goes on in your mind and um, I was just concentrating on the equipment the tools and what and the job and um, I could just remember you know really just making a statement and we all just having to run to the helicopter but fast forward a few months um, went back to that location in the helicopter and that's when I was really scared because I did not realize at that time how close we were to the paraclassic floor to everything that was happening until so wait, a few months. At that time, when you said Willie made a call, there was a paraclassic flow actually happening yes, that was, you weren't aware of. <laughs> well, it, we could well, see that there was activity and, and yeah. it was there was a contact, but Willie was our safety person on the ground and there was somebody at the observatory. So right. um, there was that element of danger but and risk, but safety was in place in terms of it, Willie was, was monitoring. But I wasn't paying any mind to that. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I was excited. You know, I was excited. It was my first big experience to do something big on an active volcano. I was really close to the dome, and I was, I was excited about what I was doing. And then I had to make a decision. I fumbled a bit about the tools I was using because I wasn't accustomed to use all of these, um, you know, what I considered back then expensive tools and, and so on, you know, so forth. So I, I didn't know whether or not I should run and leave the tools, <laughs> you know. So, so um, you know, as Rod said early on, you know, it's important um, the, the whole safety aspect of it, of monitoring volcano, um, it's rather important. And I mean, the fact that we're here today talking about monitoring the volcano and, and how we've transcended from the start, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity to really look at all of that. Because if I, if I may, Vita, I just want to highlight the fact that um, persons would, would, would look at it and say, well, you know, um, the MVO we probably don't need the MVO now. And um, for me, this is when I actually worked more. Um, Andy mentioned the equipment coming in and rod and, and, and all that went on at that time. Um, during the height of activities, there's so much that you could do, only so much that you could do, and the way in which you do it is very limited. Um, when you have this sort of pause in activity, it allows you to go back and really do a proper insulation. You probably have five minutes to jump out of a helicopter, put something in place, risk your life very seriously. Probably only one person could get out of the helicopter. Perhaps you have to throw it out of the helicopter or something like that. Um, no, you could actually go back and build a proper station. Mm -hmm. The element of risk is still there. It's less, but it's still an element of risk. But you could actually do something better. Mm -hmm. you know. And um, of course, with the advent of technology, we have more equipment that is that is geared and designed towards volcano monitoring. Back then, a lot of the equipment in Montserrat, we couldn't afford um, mm -hmm. when I came. And so we had to be um, developing and designing um, a lot more instruments back then. You know, so it, it's, it's been great for me. Mm, absolutely. And um, interesting what you said in terms of being, you know, having, being strapped with resources and sometimes you having to create and, and manipulate your own equipment, which I know falls a lot in your lap. So um, interesting. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Lockhart, again, um, it, it would be interesting to hear from you your perspective on, you know, are there any monitoring techniques that were introduced here on Monstra first that you've seen being used for the benefit of, of other, other countries around the world? Because I know you, you're renowned for your experience in um, volcanoes across the world. So it'll be interesting to hear your, your perspective there. I, I I think of this as a as a as a continuum, sort of from one uh, from one one vol one volcano to the next. And the um, the thing that sticks out in my mind about about the Soufrier Hills volcano is and and Montserrat in general is a, you look at Montserrat, it's a small island with a fairly large population that's very close to a small volcano, and it's a small dome-forming volcano, which is a specific type of volcano, as you know, in, in, the, in the spectrum of, of general volcanoes. And, and it's kind of the first time that we had in the USGS worked on 
worked on a system like that, where you had a small dome forming volcano with, with sticky magma and a population basically trapped around its, around, its, uh, around its sides. And so monitoring for that situation is a very different prospect from monitoring on a volcano where people are not near it and who might have time to time to time to get ready time to flee if something happens so in montserrat the 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 uh for us the focus was really on getting actionable information at a very a very short time span and being able to disseminate it through the through the population so that you'd get the information like rod says you you acquire it you store it then you have to do something with it. You have to you have to be able to use it in a way that gets people out of the way. Because as volcanologists, as scientists, our job dealing with these volcanoes is is primarily to to save lives. And if we're not saving lives, we're you know we're not not doing our job. So working working on those sorts of time frames is. Um, has become more common at, at volcanoes in places like Indonesia, where you do have very large populations around them. And so some of these lessons that we that we started to learn at, at Montserrat have been uh, have been carried forward. And so that's sort of general sort of thing. As far as specific tools, um, the tilt meters that we put on Montserrat um, didn't really do much for us except in one case where they, uh, one of the tilt meters um, had a precursory signal to uh, a, an explosive event, a cracking of the, of the old dome. And another thing that happened during that period of time, during those first few months when the dome was being forced apart by magma moving up from underneath, was we had uh, uh, we saw the generation of small lahars, mud flows as water was forced out of the of the ground by the by the motion of the, of the magma, and it was a the the event that happened uh, at 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 Sufrier Hills volcano was 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 very small. Um, it was not very dangerous. It was notable seismically in fact we when we saw the signal uh, we didn't recognize it as a lahar we thought it was a protracted ash emission and i think that as a result some some there were some evacuations around around long ground subsequently it turned out that it was a was a lahar this sort of phenomena we have seen at other volcanoes and we're just still trying to wrap our heads around the dynamic of a a new intrusion into an old dome uh, dome complex, and that is still very much, I think, a an, uh, a, an area of active active study because they happen so infrequently, and they have been captured uh, by monitoring data so infrequently and and in such a ragged manner that we just don't really have have a grip on it, but that's a that's a Montserratian uh, story that's that's being has been carried forward and is still uh, still continuing. Um, other things, I think that the uh, uh, the the earthquake sequence that uh, was uh, present before the uh, uh, before the eruption, uh, the distal VT swarms that were occurring there, we uh, we recognized at the time as being likely due to magmatic in, intrusion and as an indicator that the activity was magmatic rather than hydrothermal based. Um, those had had been seen before, but they have been seen quite a bit since then. And now there is a they are part of a uh, the sort of standard model by which people uh, with which people interpret interpret uh, seismicity at volcanoes and I'm sure that Rod can uh, speak to this with with uh, with authority um, those are a couple of things from from 25 years ago 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and that's Dr. Andy Lockhart from the United States Geological Survey. So let's talk. We are in MVO Talks and we are discussing monitoring of the Safria Hills volcano, evolution methods and challenges. And I'm inviting everybody who's listening at home to feel free to call in and ask any one of the, the team here on Ireland or our special guests from the United States. Um, Andy Lockhart, call in 491-7227 or WhatsApp us on 495-2029 or pop your question on the Facebook chat. And just to, uh, to let you know, we have Tarek Brown on Facebook and he asks, how much of the data is publicly available? Data Viz Pro here would love to have a set to play with. So... Who wants to take that? I, I, I guess as, as former director, I'm probably best to do that. The data we will happily share with people for research and especially with other volcano observatories. So if people want to use the data for something, then they, they just have to ask us. OK, we don't have it freely available openly, but if a party is interested in, in looking at the data and has a, a good thing to use it for, then they just need to get in touch with us and we'll put together an agreement that, that will allow them to do that. But um, it, it's very important having access to, to data and in some areas it, it's, it's shared more than, the, than in other areas. But um, yeah, we, we, we like to share it, but it's not normally freely available. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Tariq, um, you know, DM us on, on Facebook if you'd like with your details and your request and we'll look into that for you. Uh, also, we let me share our email address if anybody wants to contact us for, for data requests or anything such, such as that. Or perhaps um, you'd like some information from MVO Outreach. You know, email us at mvomonserat at gmail.com. And um, another question that came in from Danny Joseph on Monday was, how has MVO and our island of Montserrat benefited from the improvements in technologies? You've, you've alluded to that, um, you know, to some extent, but can we go a little bit further into that to answer Mr. Joseph? It's a very interesting question, and, and Andy talked about this a little bit. When I started out in volcanoes oh, a long time ago, and... I think I got this phrase from the USGS. I was told that in, in, in volcano monitoring, we use trailing edge technology. We don't <laughs> use... Lead it. Do you remember that, Andy? I don't know who it is. Oh, heard. yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. I think that yeah, came we, from you. We, can... we don't use the latest thing because the latest thing is still being tested and it breaks down. And, and we have that. People bring things, they try it, breaks down, they go away, they try and fix it. And, we need continuous data. So the, the important thing is that we use technology that's tried and tested. We can advance that technology, and I think we can advance especially the processing of it, but we really are just sort of keeping up with everyone else. We're, we're not that concerned in sort of the, the latest and, and the greatest. Yeah, okay. So, Paiko, it's be interesting to hear your perspective <laughs> on this. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, as, ask as, the man who has to maintain it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah um, I think what Andy Rod um, spot on. Um, definitely trailing technology, but it feels very, um, very cutting edge to us, and we do get some cutting edge, and we 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 do have um, we do have a lot of input from persons who are very modern with their fingers. So the the programmers have been they yeah. have been at it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of tools to try to make what feel trailing edge, cutting edge. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's very important. I think I mentioned, I alluded early on to the safety aspect of it. And, and um, that's what I think the statement that Rod made is speaking to, the, the, the safety aspect of it. Because we have, um, I like to remind person that MVO is really a monitoring um, observatory. And that's our first and primary objective. Um, you have a lot of universities, a lot of people we interact with and their research base and they would like to write a paper and do whatever. So coming back to this trailing edge technology, it helps us to remain that way and stay focused that way because we have something that is tested, it's working, we can make it better for our, our purpose and researchers can actually take the data and do work with it, make it better. 
But our primary focus is to really save life. You know, that's our first thing, to get that information out. And if we have things that we're continually just trying to upgrade Windows 20, Windows 25, Windows 106, then somewhere along the line, something breaks, we can't fix it. Um, an important thing to note is that, as Andy said, the maintenance of it, um, it's hard because you're stuck in the middle. So okay. some, some, indus some industries do not uh, maintain what you have, so you have to, you're forced to learn to maintain it mm -hmm. um, because it's so far behind. But keeping it working is very important, and that is what you know works. Yes. So you you know you have to stick with that. So it's okay. it's, it's kind of a striking that balance. It's, thank you. And, and before we, we go on, so you know, stick a pin right there. We had a we had a call, and our caller is gone. Um, oh. So I was getting excited there to hear what the general public have to to contribute and to ask to to you gentlemen. So so yeah, let's continue. Um, I, let's continue. I, to add to what Pike was saying. The, the USGS, I remember at one stage. The okay, we have a caller oh. again, so just put a pause right yes. there. And caller, good morning and welcome to MVO Talks. Yeah, good morning to you. Good morning, um, Mr. Wilson. Can you, can you tell me whether your last SAC advisory report is available? Yes. The, the last SAC advisory report it was publicly well, available within a month of the SAC. So it's available on the MVO website www.mvo.ms or send an email and uh, Vita will, will, will forward it to you. But yes, the last site, the site reports are always published about a month after the meeting. Okay, um, let me ask a question now. After 25 years of monitoring, what is it at this point that is the most concern to you about the volcano? Um, let me ask you then, let me put it straight. Is the volcano still active? Is the dome still growing? What about the stability of the dome? In your last scientific report, there was concern about a continuous expansion or swelling. Can you address those concerns for me? Okay, the, the, the dome is not growing. The, the dome seems to be relatively stable. The, the swelling in the, in, in the report is basically the swelling of the entire island, which is slowly inflating. The, I, I don't like using the word concern, but the thing that, that sort of surprises me at the moment is that the volcano hasn't gone quiet. You know, it's now many years is it since the last 2010 was the last activity over 10 years but it's still belching out gas it's still got earthquakes it's still swelling the volcano has not gone back to a, a quiet state which it was probably in before the eruption and that's the reason why we are not in a position to say that it is not active it is clearly still potentially active that it is not going back to sleep and, and that's something that we're keeping a very very close watch on Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and Mr. Wilson, thank you so much for your contribution as well by way of your question. Um, right. So we have another we have another caller. We have another caller coming through. So welcome to Envy Your Talks. Please go ahead. Just to, just, just to expand a bit, the, the swelling word is of concern to me. Can you give me some assurance or uh, give me some explanation, please? The whole world is, is moving. The whole world is moving very slowly. Tectonic plates are, are moving around. And there's, there is something, the magma chamber is, is, is the cause, underneath the island that is growing slowly. It, it's swelling slowly. It, it's not a, a, a huge push. This swelling at some stage has to change. It will either stop or it will end in some more volcanic activity. And that's what we're keeping an eye out for. Given the quietness over the last 10 years, I don't think the volcanic activity will start that suddenly. There should be precursory signs, but we have to ward against that. So there's still something down there trying to get out, but it could well run out of steam. Um, but we just have to wait and see. We, we do as much monitoring as we can. We're trying to understand this. We're looking at our data, new ways to do it. 
but we really have to let the volcano tell us what's going on. But the swelling is it is small, um, but it is sort of continuous and it's there and it's something that we just need to keep watching. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you so much, um, uh, Mr. Stewart. No, back to um, our chat on Facebook, Facebook Live. We have. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce his name. Solistaniani, who has um, commented on Facebook, and, and the comment was, Rod Stewart, I love your presentation. I would like to, <laughs> I would like to ask <laughs> about, you have a fan out there, Rod, and um, the question is, I would, <laughs> I would like to ask about how do you count the number of earthquakes? Do you use several stations or only use one reference station? Is it possible to calculate the magnitude of completeness of your network to reduce the earthquake count bias? Good question. Oh, my gosh. This, this person's a seismologist. <laughs> yes, we have about she, 10. She's very smart. <laughs> yes, we have about 10 seismic stations in, in total, which allows us to detect the earthquakes, to locate them, and to measure their magnitude. So we know roughly where they are. The magnitudes, oh, I think the largest we've had is magnitude 4, but they're normally magnitude 2.5 or, or less. And... Oh, I've forgotten the number, but we've had thousands, thousands of earthquakes since this, this eruption started. And, and it's not just earthquakes, we record rock falls as well, which are a very important indicator of, of the growing dome. And I think we've had 100,000 rock falls since, since it started. So we've actually got scientific reports and things like that that let us understand the bias and try and, and make sure we've got this, this, this even playing field. But there are times when it's a challenge. We, we lose stations and we can't get to them. And recently, I was very concerned about our locations because I think there was a location bias and, and, and trying to understand that. But uh, seismic monitoring, and, and a lot of people are going to hit me for saying this, but it's probably the most important real-time monitoring we have of the volcano. And it's a very mature technology. Every single volcano observatory uses it. It's the first thing you put in. And therefore... There's a lot of knowledge out there, and there's a lot of experts, and it's something that, uh, well, I enjoy doing. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. And um, you know, back to back to Pico. And um, well, can I jump in? Go again? ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, because Pico was talking about keeping old equipment working, mm. and I was talking about Vida. <laughs> and I remember back in the days that. The Americans for their monitoring had used it on this small computer, because computers were not that easy to get in those days. I think it was a Tandy computer, and it was going out of production. And the United States Geolog Geological Survey, I think, bought up every single Tandy computer they could find, just in case they needed them in the next few years. <laughs> Okay, and um, again, good morning to MVO Talks. We have another caller on the line. Go ahead, caller. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry, it's the motorbike. <laughs> um, yes, I'm just calling. Um, I have some um, newspaper clippings mm. from, like, USA Today. Going back at the time of the height of the volcano, I came across them. And also, um, at the height of the volcano, a lot of people did have computer. And I used to come home from work, and, you know, we would go into MVO and do printout. So I have, like, two binders of printout at that time with the height of the volcano. Um, are you interested in them or you have those reports? Absolutely, we're interested in them. And um... Because, you know, I'm going down in age <laughs> and, you know, my vision is kind of like off and I'm not sure if my children will, you know, want them or, you know, keep them because the younger people today, you know, sometimes some might be interested, some might not, you know, especially if they don't reside here. Yeah, we're, we're definitely always building binders. on the, the archive I used of to information. Print out every day, at the height of the volcano, there weren't too many people had um, computers at that time. It sounds like a, a precious collection that would would really go be valuable to our, the archive that we're building um, at the MVO. And also, I don't know if you're aware um, or might have heard our session on it was um, Tuesday, and the mountainaglow.com 
website is is live now and it sort of goes through a timeline of information and the team that have been working on that have been doing exactly that trying to source old clippings and so on so that would be an incredible value um to to the archive for educational purposes and outreach and as really as well as for the, just the history of our volcano so thank you so much for that i don't know if you can scan and send to us by email or if you um you want to throw it in a post but we can talk about that um later on you can um if you have whatsapp you whatsapp us at four nine five two zero two nine and we'll talk through the details so thank you so much Cola, for that can, can i add, just add to that because scientists who have been coming here and working they, they don't think about posterity and so they're not very good at keeping records and things and there's quite a few things missing in our archive when you go back to the early days trying to piece things together and so any resource like that that's out there is very, very useful for us to try and get a, a complete archive. Okay. Um, and again, um, absolutely loving our Facebook followers today. And thank you so much for your engagement. We've got Don Gordon Pearson, who's asking the question, if money were no object, <laughs> if money was an object in the ideal world, is there some equipment or method that would be useful in understanding the status of the volcano? And I'm going to put that call out to that that mess that question out to um, Dr. Lockhart first, and then I'll, I'll bring it around to um, I'm going to hear what Pico has to say as well. So, Dr. La Dr. Lockhart, you first. If money was no object, what should we it's, have? It's it has never been the case that money was no object, and so it's not a not a question that I think many of us are used to used to thinking about. But yeah, yeah for, from uh, it, it, in in my opinion, what you would want would be um, many more seismic stations for array seismology. You would want a very large number of, of deformation monitors scattered over the volcano, both GPS and, and, and tilt. Uh, you would want uh, a, good, uh, a good network of, of uh, telemetry gas monitoring equipment. Um, and of course, if money were no, no object, you'd have a geostationary satellite parked above Montserrat, keeping a 24 hour uh, view, of the, view, of the, view of the volcano. But yeah, you know, money money is the object, and and um, that's that's really not the world that we live in. <laughs> okay, so that's um, so Don Gordon Pearson. You've you've heard it directly from, um, you know, uh, one the, one of the, the the men who are responsible for all all bringing bringing the gear. Bringing the gear, he 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 has that he has that knowledge, that background, and um, and he's saying, well, it's um it's not often the case, but we can dream, we can dream as to how we can always make it better. And um, Paiko, is for, there anything? For, for, <clears throat> if I can, for purposes of 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 comparison, since we are talking about the the sort of thing that the that the USGS does, and and, and I have to say that the the work that the USGS does in 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 VDAP is fully paid for by USAID. So it is US foreign aid that's doing it. And they basically are, are contracting to the USGS to, to do this work. But we have, um, uh, like Rod suggested, we have, we have cash, a cache of equipment at our observatory, which is capable of doing full complete, two complete volcano responses, which is to say that we can do like we did in 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 in, in Rabal in 1994, Rod, we can come com, come in and do a complete mm -hmm. volcano observatory installation uh, twice with what we've got in our in our cache. And the the basic cost of that kind of equipment comes to something around um, a quarter of a million dollars U.S. Uh, that's the cost of the equipment to do a. A, 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 a fundamental volcano observatory. Now, I think that what you've got in Montserrat is, you know, looking at the number of stations you've got, it's worth much more than that. And that's correct because you've got a history, you've got a population, and, and Montserrat merits a much higher level of mon monitoring than, than VDAP would be able to, to, to provide uh, tomorrow. But I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I have an, another thing which is uh, sort of feeding 
uh, feeding on what uh, what what Pico and Rod said about about the state of Montserrat right now, and Pico said that he's very busy because, as opposed to during a crisis when you just have to get out and get something done quickly and get back before you incur much hazard, now he's very busy getting back to the stations, solidifying the stations, making them hardening them, making them last longer, and and um, you know, making them capable of making the networks capable of detecting more subtle indications, which is where you need to be right now, at the end of a long period of activity, possibly, and we don't know. And Rod, Rod mentioned this. Don't know whether it's going to lead into more activity, maintain this level, or or slowly die away. This is when you need that kind of instrumentation installed, getting good data so you can detect the subtle signs that might tell you whether it's going to increase to another eruption, continue to maintain stability or, or drop off. And, and as they were talking, I was thinking of examples that I could think of of other volcanoes and thinking of Mount St. Helens, which is similar to Montserrat in its dome formation. And we had an eruption in 1980 and then in 2000, 2004, we had another set of dome building eruptions that just sort of came out of nowhere. You think of the volcano in, in, in Guatemala, Santiaguito, which is another dome forming volcano similar to Montserrat that has been erupting continuously since 1902. So there's a variety of things that, that Sufrior Hills can do, and it's entirely appropriate that, that, that MVO will be ready for whatever happens next. Thank you so much, Dr. Lockhart. And on that note, we have reached the end of MVO oh. Talks for today. We had a couple questions left to ask, and uh, it looks like we're going to have to all come back. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today on MVO Talks. And thank you so much to all of our followers on Facebook for engaging our listeners on um, on Radio Montserrat, thank you as well. And Dr. Lockhart, it's been our pleasure, absolute pleasure having you here um, live in the studio with us. And we look forward to seeing you on Montserrat again soon. I don't know what your plans are for 2021, but as you know, we are, we're actually um, doing, we hopefully, fingers crossed, SHV 25 conference will now be happening in, tw in 2021. SHV 26. <laughs> and it's, it, I don't know, it should it be, it's, it's still 20, 20, 25 that we haven't had. So, um, so that conference will be happening next year. And um, if you stay tuned to Envia Talks tomorrow, we'll be releasing the new date. And um, so stay locked and we look forward to hopefully seeing Dr. Lockhart on Island in person then. And um, to ZJB, thank you, GIU team, MAC, the Seismic Research Center um, in Trinidad, and the Office of the Premier, thank you so much. We welcome your feedback um, on these sessions and stay tuned for tomorrow. And before I go, let me share with you that tomorrow we're going to be having our last of this series of MVA Talks. It's going to be on the topic, Montserrat's Perspectives, Lessons Learned Since 1995. And it's a very dynamic panel tomorrow with the um, former Premier, um, Mr. Ruben Timid and Professor Richie Robinson from the SRC. We have Major Alvin Ryan and Professor Jenny Barkley, who will be joining us for a, uh, a very lively discussion, no doubt, on the lessons learned on um, uh, Sufria Hills Volcano. So until next time, my name is Vita Wade, and goodbye. ZJB Radio, Munzerat. Listen to us live on www.zjb.gov.ms. ZJB Radio, Munzerat. Listen to us live on www.zjb.gov.ms. <laughs>